I feel like I've been repeating myself a lot during my Assassin's Creed series retrospective, at least for the last few games I've reviewed. Valhalla is a big game, a very big game, and that was true even before it got any downloadable content. Some people say more is more, some people say less is more. I think both can be true, it just depends on what kind of game a developer is trying to make and what kind of game you personally enjoy playing. There is no doubt in my mind that Ubisoft went for the more is more approach with their last few AC games, especially Valhalla, which is bigger than Odyssey, and I already thought that game was too big. I titled this video Bang for Your Buck because it is. You can buy this one game and spend a few hundred hours playing through everything it has to offer. Whether or not the quality of that content is worth it is a different story. I played Assassin's Creed Valhalla for one playthrough on normal difficulty. This video will not contain any major spoilers. Valhalla looks gorgeous, from the snow-covered mountains of Norway to the green rolling hills and valleys of England. Ubisoft doesn't slouch in the visuals department when it comes to most of their games, particularly Assassin's Creed. The settings of these games is a massive part of their appeal, so recreating these historical locations with all their noteworthy landmarks and natural splendor is paramount to making the experience worthwhile. It still hasn't gotten old for me, even after all these games, to climb to the top of viewpoints and sync synchronize, and I don't think it ever will. The game is set in 9th century England, and for as beautiful as the world is, I just didn't find it as compelling as other settings in the franchise. Egypt, Greece, Italy, these locations felt more unique and interesting to me. I've seen green hills and forests in many a video game, and while I still enjoyed traipsing through the various cities and locales of England, it just didn't feel as special as some of the other settings in the franchise. Animations are pretty well done, as is the norm for the series, but they feel a little bit more exaggerated this time around, which caught me off guard at first. The facial animations are still pretty stiff during regular conversations, but obviously this is a big game, and you can't animate every single interaction with the same level of detail as your main cutscenes, which do have good facial animations. The lighting is great, with sun rays peering through overcast clouds on fields of golden wheat as you explore England's countryside. But during cutscenes, the lighting is much more dramatic, with dark shadows and golden and highlights. Sailing isn't as big of a part of Valhalla as it was in Odyssey, but you still have a long boat that you can use to float down the many rivers of England. Though I'm not a huge fan of the water droplets that hit your screen when you're sailing or swimming. Character models are generally pretty well detailed and varied. There are also a bunch of different appearance customization options for Eivor, the player character, such as different hairstyles and tattoos. The voice acting is solid overall. There are a lot of characters, and at least the story-relevant ones have pretty good acting. Not every NPC has a believable performance, but that is forgivable when you think about the sheer size of this game. Valhalla's musical score is pretty fantastic. Combining the tribal mystic sounds of Nordic Viking music with more modern atmospheric production touches to create the perfect sonic backdrop for Valhalla's Viking adventure. The score was composed by Sarah Schockner, who has quickly made a name for herself in the games industry, and Jesper Kidd, who composed the score for the first four games in the franchise. Cracking a skull with your Viking axe sounds as viscerally horrific and satisfying as you'd expect it to, as does the galloping footsteps of your horse across the various surfaces you travel like grass and rocky paths. What I'm trying to say is that the sound effects are good. The game runs at a pretty steady 60 frames per second on the Series X if you choose high frame rate modes over quality mode, which I always do, but there are some hitches whenever you're in cities that can be annoying. The game glitched out once after a cutscene and I was frozen in place and couldn't move, so I had to reload a save. The game also crashed a couple times, but all things considered, these are very minor gripes for a game this big and long. In the Siege of Paris DLC, there is a weird movement speed bug whenever you're on your horse. For some reason, you are unable to gallop while riding your horse in the DLC if you are near a city. In the main game, you can't gallop while you're in cities, but in the DLC, you cannot gallop even if you are in the general vicinity of a city. Valhalla has a a lot of options and settings and accessibility options, so whatever your situation may be, I'm sure you'll be able to configure the game to something that works for you. 
You play as either a male or female Eivor Wolfkist of the Raven Clan. Valhalla actually allows you to switch between male or female whenever you want, or choose a setting that randomly switches between male and female, which is something I don't think I've ever seen in a game before. The game begins in Norway, where Eivor and their brother Sigurd are displeased by their father's decision to bow at the feet of a new king attempting to unite all of Norway. So they both decide to set out to England to conquer and settle there, hoping to grow their clan in their new home. Eivor encounters Basim and Hytham early on in the game, who are both hidden ones, aka assassins, and ends up helping them take down the Order of Ancients, aka Templars, throughout the course of the game. As the Order have taken root in England, and taking them down aligns with Eivor's goal of gaining influence in England. Basim is also the main character of the next Assassin's Creed game, Mirage. Of course, there's also the modern day storyline with Layla, who is admittedly a little less intolerable this time around, and actually has has a sort of character arc that felt kind of satisfying. You can switch between the Animus and Modern Day at almost any point in the story. All in all, I'd say that I enjoyed Valhalla's story for the most part, but there are issues. Firstly, the structure of the story doesn't really lend itself to telling a compelling story. Once in England, you gain access to the Alliance map, which divides England into 16 different regions. Each region has a different quest line to complete in order to gain an alliance with them to strengthen your settlement's foothold in England. These regions don't have to be completed in any specific order, but there are level recommendations for each, which sort of gives you a progression to follow. In Assassin's Creed Odyssey, there were three distinct main storylines to follow, which were the Order of Ancient storyline, the Atlantis storyline, and the Family storyline, which all intertwined and coalesced in interesting ways. Valhalla sort of has the same idea with Sigurd's storyline, the Order of Ancient storyline, and I guess Eivor's connection to Odin, from whom they receive advice and visions from throughout the entire game. But these three elements just didn't really come together for me as well as they did in Odyssey, and I can't quite put my finger on why. Each region you go to will have a set of new characters to get introduced to that you don't really get the chance to get attached to considering how many of them there are and how long the game is. There are certain points in the story where characters will return, but by those points I had genuinely forgotten who some of them were. The momentum of the narrative suffers because of this type of structure, and while this certainly isn't a problem unique to Valhalla, it's something that plagues a lot of open world games, Valhalla's story exemplifies those problems. I was interested in continuing the Sigurd storyline, only to have to put that on hold to complete a bunch of other less interesting quest lines with forgettable characters. Valhalla changes the way the quests work from Odyssey. Odyssey had a more traditional main quest slash side quest type of structure, where side quests often them did end up tying into one of the main quests, but a lot of which were their own thing, and most of them were relatively fleshed out and felt worth doing. Valhalla doesn't really have side quests per se, where you can begin a quest, then decide to finish it later, and the quest is being tracked in the side quest tab in your quest log. Instead, Valhalla has what are called mysteries, which encompass side quests and side objectives. Mysteries range from making cairns, which are these physics-based mini-games involving placing rocks into a tower, to slaying mini-boss animals like a polar bear, to mini-side quests. I call them mini side quests because none of them are fleshed out enough to call them full on side quests in my opinion. They mostly consist of talking to a character, completing a small objective pretty quickly, then talking to a character again. A lot of them also have a comedic spin to them as well. There was one where a guy was upset that his colony of nudists didn't like how he thought they had to be naked everywhere, so he asked the player to go steal their clothes so they wouldn't have a choice. Another one saw two brothers fighting over how they should split the profit from their farming operation and the way to solve the issue is to burn down their farm so that there's nothing to fight over anymore. I enjoyed these mysteries, but ultimately they don't really fill the spot in my heart that I have for fully fleshed out side quests that stick with you as much as the main story, like you'd see in other RPGs like Cyberpunk or Mass Effect. And I hope that Assassin's Creed Shadows ditches the mysteries and returns to the typical side questing style. I am not a history expert by any stretch of the imagination, so I don't really have much knowledge about the period of history this game explores, but I I will say that I did experience a feeling of cognitive dissonance at multiple parts of the story due to the fact that we are playing as the invaders to another country. Raiding is a mechanic in the game, where you go to a village and steal their supplies and wealth, and kill everyone that gets in your way. And I couldn't help but feel kind of weird every
every time I did one considering that we are just attacking this random village full of people just living their lives and killing their people and taking their valuables. I mean, Valhalla still does the Assassin's Creed thing where if you kill civilians you get desynchronized which is quite funny to me when you end up killing people who are just trying to defend their homes anyways because they're holding weapons. Vikings also did do a lot of other bad things to people that they raided and or conquered, but I don't think the game ever really brings it up. That in and of itself wouldn't necessarily bother me, it's not like I have a problem with playing games where you aren't a good guy, I mean I like GTA as much as anybody else, it's just that I never really felt like the game fully acknowledges exactly what's going on I guess. One of the ways the game tries to justify Eivor's actions is that most of England is under the control of the Order, which, you know, fair enough, the Order sucks and taking them out would probably be a good thing to do. But it almost feels like hand wavy in a way, like, oh, England's under control by bad people, so don't think about your actions that much and just enjoy the Viking story. Which I ultimately did, but I couldn't help but feel like Ubisoft dropped the ball a bit with the narrative in this regard. It feels incredibly sanitized, almost Disney-like in the way that it ignores a lot of the worst parts of real Viking history. Over the course of the game, I felt like you didn't really get to influence Eivor as much as you did Alexios. There were multiple points in the game where Eivor would do something in a cutscene that seemed like I should have been given a choice to decide what I wanted to do as the player, but the game made the choice for me. Valhalla does have a handful of romance options that don't really amount to much, but there's also a very clear romance partner that the game really encourages you to partner with. The game has a couple different endings but ultimately Valhalla's story felt very much on rails for the most part, which does make me wonder what the point of making these games have all these choices is, if the game isn't actually built around letting those choices affect the story in meaningful ways. The game has a discovery tour that takes you on a semi-guided museum-like tour of the game's world with a lot of information and historical facts, but Valhalla also brings back the codex from older games, which is available to browse during regular gameplay. Valhalla takes the gameplay framework from Odyssey, and while most of it is largely unchanged, there are some tweaks to it that I feel were a little bit unnecessary. Parkour is as simple and easy as it's been since Origins, allowing you to scale basically anything you can see and reach. Eivor unfortunately does not have Alexios' ability to survive falling from any height, which was difficult to go back from. You can upgrade your mount to make it be able to swim, have more health, and consume less stamina when galloping. As I mentioned previously, Valhalla still has a sale mechanic, but it's not anywhere near as integral to the experience as it was in Odyssey. You can manage your longship's crew, which determines who you'll have with you during raids, but it didn't seem to make any tangible difference. You can summon your ship at any point as long as you're near water. While you can sail up to a raiding location you don't have to, you can also approach on foot and then use your horn to summon your crew to begin the raid. Apart from the cognitive dissonance aspect, raiding gives you valuable supplies and raw materials that you can use to upgrade your settlement, Raven's Thorpe. The Ravensthorpe system reminds me of the homestead or villa system from earlier Assassin's Creed games. You can construct a general shop, blacksmith, tattoo shop, and hidden ones bureau, among many others. Apart from gaining access to these various facilities, building up Ravensthorpe will increase the settlement's reputation, giving you access to more buildings to construct as you level up. It also brings new characters to your settlement as well, with some accompanying quests to complete. I really enjoyed the system as it made me feel as invested in Ravensthorpe as Eivor was, although it did eventually plateau before reaching max level. I believe for the first time in the series, you can fish. You can bring specific fish to your fishing hut in Ravensthorpe once you construct it for various rewards. Fishing itself is a pretty standard mechanic where you have to use the sticks to reel it in while button mashing. I only did this a couple times though because I don't care for fishing in video games as much as I don't care for it in real life. Valhalla includes various minigames that apparently Vikings engaged with in their free time. There's this dice minigame which is actually pretty cool once you get the hang of it, a drinking game which is just a quick time event, and flighting which is like the proto form of battle rapping. Flighting involves getting into a battle of words and poetry with an NPC, and if you win you gain charisma XP. I liked flighting a lot even though the charisma system in the game is pretty bare bones and only comes up a handful of times. Elements of social stealth get reintroduced in Valhalla after being mostly absent for the last couple games. Eivor can blend in on benches to avoid being noticed by guards, as well as moving incognito amongst a group of monks. You can also lure drunks to specific spots to create a ruckus that guards will go investigate, enabling 
enabling you to sneak into areas undetected. These options are nice to see return, but I rarely use them as you have so many other avenues to approach stealth in these most recent AC games. Hiding in tall grass is how you likely spend most of your time stealthing, as well as whistling to attract guards to your location, allowing you to quietly dispatch them. Sadly, while double assassinations are still missing in action, you can assassinate strong enemies with a well-timed press of a button. You can also toggle instant assassinations on in the options menu if you really want that old-school Assassin's Creed experience. Putting on your hood when in restricted areas gives you more of a chance to pass by unnoticed. Your Raven Sunin can be used to gain an aerial view of your surroundings as well to mark points of interest like chests or keys, or find specific areas you need to reach for a quest. However, unlike Origins and Odyssey, your Raven no longer marks enemies. The only way to mark enemies now is by using your Eagle Vision, which sends a wave of blue around your immediate vicinity and highlights anything important. This change is kind of strange as it more or less renders your Raven obsolete, so I found myself only using Sunin to scout out exploration areas for quests. Valhalla no longer has recharging health at the start. You have rations that you can use to regain health, or you can eat berries from bushes in the wild. You can upgrade your ration pouch to increase the amount you can hold. There are multiple resource types that can be used to upgrade your rations, quiver, bows, weapons, and armor. The game allows you to toggle your equipment on and off depending on whether or not you want it to appear on your character while still keeping it equipped. And it has transmog as well, which allows you to essentially mix and match the stats and appearance of your equipment, though there is a specific currency for transmog. The combat system and everything else tied to it is where things start to differ from Odyssey the most. Eivor has a light attack and heavy attack. Using your light attack will refill your stamina gauge, while heavy attacks will drain it. Dodging also drains stamina, and so does blocking with your shields, which have made a return after being absent in Odyssey. Some enemies also have stamina bars, and you can shoot specific parts on their bodies to do extra damage to their stamina meter. Once a stamina segment has been drained, you can do a stun attack on an enemy dealing massive damage. You can dual wield weapons instead, which means you'll probably be focusing on parrying attacks, which is indicated by a glinting flash. Enemies glow red when they are using an unblockable attack, while dual wielding the block button becomes a combo attack essentially. Vikings apparently enjoyed curb stomping their adversaries as Eivor now has the option of stomping an enemy that's been knocked down, jumping over to them like a rabbit before bringing down the hurt. The overpower ability is gone from Valhalla, and while it was a fun mechanic in the last two games, I don't think its absence negatively affects the combat here. The biggest change is how Valhalla deals with gaining more loot and abilities. Odyssey had a much more traditional loot system for an RPG where you would find lots of different weapons and gear from various chests and defeated enemies, with special items being acquired upon completing specific quests or objectives. Whereas in Valhalla, the only way for you to gain loot besides completing quests is to find it in the world and specific chests. You do not get any loot from killing enemies. You can upgrade your weapon and armor stats by expending various resources, and you can embed runes which give bonuses like extra damage or health. Similarly, your active abilities are no longer tied to leveling or XP. Instead, you need to find books of knowledge across the game world to unlock abilities. Each ability has two levels, though I don't think there's any way to determine where the second part of the ability is located. You just have to either look it up online or get lucky. Using abilities expends adrenaline, which can be regained during combat by killing enemies, parrying attacks, etc. I am of two minds with this. On the one hand, tying progression and equipment to exploration obviously greatly encourages exploration and discovery, and I can understand the desire to want the player to explore the game world. However, I think the game goes too far in this direction personally. Most RPGs are not designed like this for a reason, and I'll use Odyssey as the example because it's the most obvious one to use. There's a synergy from the design of Odyssey that is not present in Valhalla. In Odyssey, whenever you are going on a quest or a side quest, you will most likely encounter a combat situation that will result in you killing a bunch of enemies and obtaining their loot and gaining XP at the same time. This loot can then be equipped and used if it's better than your current gear or sold if it is not, which gains you money, which allows you to spend it on whatever you'd like, such as better gear, more resources, etc. And gaining XP accumulates until you can level up and then gain a new ability which makes you stronger, which makes killing enemies easier, which allows you to go on more quests and kill more enemies and gain more loot and XP. 
The loot system, combat system, ability system, and quest design all work together and feeds into itself, making a very rewarding experience. But by separating the loot and the abilities from the combat system and the experience system, it just makes Valhalla feel less synergistic and more disjointed. It also just adds more running around to an already bloated game. Granted, there are a decent amount of quests that take you near and around ability books and loot chest locations, but I just never felt the same type of satisfaction from completing a quest in Valhalla as I did in Odyssey and many other RPGs I've played because of the way they tried to innovate where I don't really think innovating was necessary. You still gain levels in Valhalla and skill points. These are now tied to your skill tree of which there are three main branches. Bear, which is melee, wolf, which is ranged, and raven, which is stealth. Every time you level up, you gain two skill points, which you can use to unlock two of the many, many nodes. Most of these nodes are passive buffs, like giving you plus two melee critical chance, though there are more active abilities like the aforementioned stomp. These skills kind of suck and seem like more of a way to artificially make you feel like you're progressing rather than actually making meaningful progression because they removed that and tied it to exploration. These branches don't even really make that much sense since you will gain ranged abilities in branches that aren't wolf and melee buffs from branches that aren't bear. Plus most of the skill trees are hidden until you unlock a corresponding node, so you don't know what you're building towards. You can reset all skills, but having to redo 200 nodes is not something that seems fun. One of the best things about Valhalla for me is that you have the option to turn off level scaling, which is something I do not like in RPGs. There is a lot of DLC content for Valhalla, as well as a ton of microtransactions. You can buy all sorts of stuff for the game, including in-game currency, crafting slash upgrade materials, weapons, armor, maps that show you where things like ability books and armor are located, XP boosts, and silver boosts. Valhalla isn't a multiplayer game, so saying that this is pay to win doesn't have the same connotation as it would in a competitive game, but that's basically what this is, and I do not feel that this kind of shit belongs in single player games sold as full priced products. There are a couple of extra quests that you can get. The Legend of Beowulf, which is included in the Season Pass, and The Way of the Berserker, which can be unlocked through Ubisoft Connect. Both of these quests are quite short, but enjoyable for what they are. Valhalla also has a crossover DLC with Assassin's Creed Odyssey called A Fated Encounter, which has an entirely new zone, the Isle of Sky. This was a pretty fun quest, although Cassandra is the eagle bearer for the DLC, which I don't have a problem with, but I did play Odyssey as Alexios, so it felt a little strange. The expansion is free, which is pretty rad. The three main DLCs for Valhalla are The Wrath of the Druids, The Siege of Paris, and The Dawn of Ragnarok. Each of these expansions has an entirely new region to explore. Wrath of the Druids takes place in Ireland, and sees Eivor reuniting with a long-lost cousin who has become a king, although he is at risk of losing his kingdom due to the political landscape. The DLC has its own version of the Order called the Children of Danu, a pagan cult with their own assassination tree and everything. The quest introduces the Trade Post mechanic, which requires you to liberate outposts across Ireland and then build them up similarly to Ravensthorpe. You gain materials for these buildings by completing royal demands, which are basically just contracts that you can do like killing a certain person or stealing something. Druids also includes a new love interest that is only available in the DLC. I liked Wrath of the Druids overall, although I didn't particularly care for the outpost system as it kinda just felt like more busy work fluff, which the game has plenty of already. And even though Ireland looks just as beautiful as every other part of the game, it still is more of the same green hills and forests. Siege of Paris might be my favorite of the DLCs with a pretty engaging story and interesting characters. Eivor is called to help the Viking Siegfried in his invasion of Paris against the Mad King Charles. While most of the environment is again not that different from the main game, Paris is more distinct. The new mechanic introduced are the rebel missions. Eivor can lend aid to various rebels across France in the fight against Charles. You can gain rebel squads to help you undertake these missions and upgrade your squad as well. Dawn of Ragnarok is the third main DLC, which is the continuation of the Asgard storyline from the main game. Eivor has visions of Odin, and through the use of special potions, is able to relive Odin's memories in Asgard, being able to visit Asgard itself and Jotunheim. Dawn of Ragnarok adds the realm of Svart where Odin is trying to rescue his son Baldur from the clutches of the fire giant Surtur. 
As interesting as I find Norse mythology, this DLC didn't really do much for me. Firstly, I feel like the depiction of Svartfelheim is kind of underwhelming. It is, once again, mostly just green hills and valley with more mountainous areas and some floating rocks in the sky. I think back to God of War and how that game visually depicted its versions of the Nine Realms and can't help but feel like this DLC misses the mark in that regard. Secondly, I just didn't really find the story that interesting, though Odin is portrayed pretty well I'd say as a shrewd and manipulative god who only really cares about what he wants. The coolest part of the DLC are the powers you can obtain from your Hooger Rip, which can steal powers from your enemies such as being able to turn into a moose spell and become immune to fire damage, or turn into a raven to quickly fly up to out of reach locations. The last piece of DLC that I played was the Forgotten Saga, which is a roguelite mode which I actually found pretty enjoyable which surprised me as I don't typically enjoy the idea of roguelikes. You play as Odin once more in Niflheim, and there is a story here that plays out as you progress through the mode and die over and over. As you make runs, you will gain memories which can be used to buy favors, which grant you advantages on your next run, or you can buy skills which don't reset, meaning you will continue to get stronger as you continue playing. There are also outfits you can unlock by defeating specific enemies. Any areas that you visit will stay revealed on your map, making subsequent runs easier to plan. During your runs, you can find upgrades to help you for that run, such as runes to give you buffs or healing or new weapons and abilities. All in all, while I wouldn't say any of the DLCs are amazing or must plays, they are all of good quality and I would recommend them to anyone who enjoyed the main game. Ultimately, I don't think that Valhalla is as good as its predecessor Odyssey, but it still is a good game. If you liked Odyssey, you'll probably like Valhalla. If you like big, long games, you'll definitely like Valhalla. If you prefer tighter, more succinct experiences, you'll probably get bored of Valhalla long before it's over. Valhalla is a big, bloated game with a shit ton of stuff to do in it. If you're the type of person that cares about hour per dollars with your games, you really can't go wrong with Valhalla. It doesn't do any one thing incredibly well, but it does a lot of things pretty good. A jack of all trades, master of none, so to speak. The story is long, with many characters who are less than memorable, but was overall an enjoyable ride. The visuals are beautiful and the music is fantastic. The gameplay is varied between combat, parkour, stealth, and traversal, and again, while none of these things are excellent, they are all good. I'm going to give Assassin's Creed Valhalla an 8 out of 10. This retrospective is almost over. It's so close I can taste it. Just one more game to go. If you liked this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, and commenting your thoughts on the game. Thanks for watching.